collaboration with the Cyprus Mail, this is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambos. Coming up on the programme this week, we talk to the Interior Minister about plans to regulate social entrepreneurship and there's money up for grabs if it gets passed by Parliament. And they will be eligible for all the incentives, either financial or other, included in the action plan with a budget starting three million point one uh, from the social, uh, social Fund of the European Union. We hear about the association between our olive trees and the fungi below the ground. It's very clear that the colonization of land by plants was probably only made possible by association with fungi. And we talk at length to one of the presidential candidates, independent Stavros Malas. And I will appoint at least 50% women in my cabinet, at least 50%. And I will also make sure that at least 50% of women will be appointed in the semi-governmental organizations in the board of directors. At a press conference last week, Interior Minister Konstantinos Petridis outlined plans to regulate social entrepreneurship and he announced that there would be money available to help expand this sector. After the conference, I asked him to explain. Today he presented the, an integrated policy on social entrepreneurship, which includes both uh, the submission to the Parliament of the relevant bill which for the first time in Cyprus defines what is a, a social enterprise, its responsibilities, and um, the, the second leg of this, of this reform has to do with a coherent action plan, which includes uh, financial incentives and financial instruments, but also other privileges that, that these social enterprises could acquire, just tell me, what do you, when you say you've made a definition of social enterprises, yeah. what is it? The definition of a social enterprise, basically it's, it's an enterprise, which it, it is an enterprise, but its primary objective is to serve a social objective, a social or an, an environmental objective that has to be defined. For example, if it uh, employs more than 40% of its, uh, of its employees, from vulnerable groups of the population, for an example. There are hundreds and thousands uh, of different social enterprises uh, around the world. Most countries, they have a legal and institutional framework. In Cyprus, there was none. While we, do, we have seen examples that there are social enterprises, but they cannot really uh, facilitate smoothly and they cannot advance and grow as much as, the, as they can and serve the social objective even better in the absence of, of an action plan and of a legal base. So what difference, what difference is this going to make to, uh, it's particularly, I would imagine it's particularly important for non-governmental organisations. They are all non-governmental. There are no state enterprises. Okay. An NGO is something different. A social enterprise has to have an entrepreneurial activity to sell goods or services in the market, okay, but to serve certain social objectives, either 70%, for example, of its profits or more to go not back to the shareholders, but for the special causes, the social objectives, or, as I said, to employ, for, for example, 40% or more of, the, of its employees from vulnerable, from vulnerable. Now, this, this Enterprises could benefit from the label, they could use exclusively the term social enterprise and they will be eligible for all the incentives, either financial or other, included in the action plan with a budget starting 3 million point one uh, from the social, uh, social Fund of the European Union under those activities that we have mentioned for the next years. So now they're eligible. Before they were not because there was uh, no definition, no legal framework, no institutional framework from these companies. Can you just tell me what impact you think this might have on the general economy of Cyprus? Because it's going to activate a lot of people. As, as I said, in the European Union, there are 11 
million people just working for, for the social enterprise. This one in four new entrepreneurs works in a social enterprise. They are more resistant to crisis. So it's, it is important when we are talking about a new model of vi viable growth also to, to put this sector of economic growth in the economic model, which is also more fair, more socially fair and more transparent. And where can people find out the details of what's available? Presumably you have a website or something? In the reform.gov.cy. The presentation will be there, the action plan will be there and everything. Interior Minister Konstantinos Petridis at the announcement of new plans to regulate social entrepreneurship in Cyprus. Keep up to date with events in Cyprus and around the world with the Cyprus News Digest. Last night saw four talks to kick off an event called Getting to Know the Queen of All Trees, the Olive Tree in the Mediterranean. There's an interactive exhibition that's opened at the French Institute in Cyprus, but it all kicked off last night with four presentations on the theme of the olive tree. One of the speakers from the Cyprus Institute was Nicolas Jarot. Nicolas, you were talking, I think, particularly about the relationship between the olive tree and fungi. I was talking, indeed, about the relationship between the olive tree and the fungi. In other words... I was talking about what has made the success of this amazing tree. It's a tree that seems to be able to survive almost anything. Drought, uh, lack of nutrients, uh, poor soils, uh, very difficult environments, and yet it keeps on surviving. Of course, that's what made it so popular as a tree that people wanted to grow all over the place, in, especially in the eastern Mediterranean. And particularly, of course, because despite all of those things, it continues to give a very valuable fruit. Indeed, so it produces this unbelievable fruit which is full of nutrients which can be used to make oil which can be eaten as it is and my talk was about what happens beneath, behind the scenes, beneath the ground that makes this olive tree so successful and in particular the fungi or the mushrooms uh, which associate with the roots of this tree and we call this association mycorrhiza and how that association, which is millions of years old, has actually enabled the olive tree to survive uh, and thrive in these difficult environments. Does that mean that the fungi actually, in a sense, feed the tree? That's very true. The fungi literally feed the tree in the sense that they wrap around the roots, the fine roots of the tree, and they extend the root network in doing so. And the, the fungal filaments are so much smaller than the root hairs, which enables them to penetrate parts of the soil which the roots otherwise couldn't access. It also enables them to access nutrients, especially, for example, uh, phosphorus, which the tree might otherwise have difficulty finding or accessing water. Uh, so the fungus feeds the tree, but the tree also feeds the fungus. It's a symbiotic relationship, then? It's a symbiotic relationship. It's the perfect example of a symbiotic relationship. In fact, this type of association between fungi and trees has existed probably for more than 400 million years. In other words, most plants that we see on land probably would not have colonized land in the first place if it hadn't been for this association. In fact, it's very clear from all the plants that we look at, that the plants that actually don't have mycorrhiza, most of them seem to have done away with it quite recently. So it's very clear that the colonization of land by plants was probably only made possible by association with fungi. And if that hadn't happened, if they hadn't met on the shores of these ancient continents, then probably the world as we know it would look very different. Probably it might have mosses, a little bit of green here and there, but this vast green vegetation that we see on all the continents except Antarctica probably would never have come into being if it hadn't been for mycorrhiza. Incidentally, uh, a lot of these fungi are actually very familiar to us. Um, all the mushrooms that people like to pick, like the red mushrooms in the forests of Cyprus in Trodos, are mycorrhizal fungi. I think it's just that most people are not aware of what's happening below the ground. But we should there add a little rejoinder, I think, that people do need to be very careful what mushrooms they do pick here. I would always 
ask people to be cautious when picking mushrooms. You can make very deadly decisions. And I would also urge people not to scrape the whole mountainsides when they're looking for these mushrooms, because by doing that, what they're doing is exposing the fungal mycelium and making sure that next year there won't be any mushrooms there. Now, does this apply to other tree species as well? You, you say trees in general for how many millions of years. I presume that the olive isn't unique in this. The vast majority of flowering plants, maybe more than 90%, have this type of association. And we find that in environments where, for example, chemical pesticides have killed off the fungi, these types of plants really struggle. Uh, the plant, of course, um, doesn't get a free meal. It has to provide food to the fungus. And the way it does that is through photosynthesis. As we know, plants produce uh, carbon sugars, and they then feed those sugars to the fungus, which itself is unable, it's below the ground, it's unable to use the energy of the sun to, to make these sugars, so it feeds those sugars to the fungus. And in return, it gets fed back again. It's fascinating. What other presentations were given last night about the olive tree? And then we'll talk about the exhibition. There were three other presentations, one from my colleague Evi Margaritis from the Cyprus Institute and uh, one from the Agriculture Research Institute, which deal more with the above ground success of the olive tree and in, uh, in, in agriculture, but also in, in archaeological terms. How long have olive trees been around and cultivated by mankind, because there is also this symbiotic relationship between people and the olive trees. There was also a presentation by a French engineer, uh, agronomist, who uh, also approached this from a different angle. So it's fascinating. You can find out all about the olive tree in the Mediterranean. And don't forget, we've got some examples here on the island that are many hundreds of years old and still going strong, probably because of those fungi that we can't actually see. The interactive exhibition is in French and Greek and it will run until February the 16th. It's open on Mondays and Wednesdays from 9 until 12.30, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9 till 12.30, and then 3 till 5.30 p.m. as well. Fridays, it's open 9 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., but I'm sure if you look for the French Institute of Cyprus online, you'll get all the details there. We were talking to Nicolas Jarot from the Cyprus Institute. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralampas. Well, we're just a couple of weeks away from presidential elections here in Cyprus, and I'm joined by one of the candidates, Stavros Malas. He's an independent candidate, but he is supported by Akel. And I've come to ask him what his main priorities are going to be if he's elected. Thank you, Rosie, for the opportunity to have a nice chat about uh, the future of Cyprus. Well, first of all, the main priority for me is to resume the talks and, uh, and hopefully uh, have a solution to the Cyprus problem. As I'm extremely concerned about the developments in the north, and I'm extremely concerned also that, um, unfortunately, in, in Cyprus, in, in the south of Cyprus, the idea of uh, living separately is gaining more and more ground, and that concerns me a lot. So number one is the Cyprus problem. We're losing, we, we don't have enough time, really, um, losing time in, in relation to resolving this issue. The second one is... Well, before you go on to the second one, can I just ask you whether you think that the Turkish Cypriots are in a frame of mind to pick up where things were left off? Well, we'll find that out. Uh, we need to um, talk to the Turkish Cypriots, that is the leadership. But I think the Turkish Cypriot society, by and large, is feeling the pressure from Turkey. The um, continuous um, movement of settlers in the north is causing really a social crisis. And uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that um, what I'm hearing recently from a lot of Turkish Cypriots is, is a cry of desperation. Uh, I've met quite a few of them and they say, do something about it. Let's move forward. Otherwise, 
we're vanishing from the face of Cyprus. So and what about the attitude of the general public in the South? Because there is a suggestion, and I think it, there is probably something in it, that even if uh, President Anastasiades had come to an agreement in Crans Montana in a referendum, the South may not have voted yes. Well, we needed to see, of course, what the end result of that uh, agreement would be. It depends what the agreement would look like and then, and then decide. Uh, but I think that um, the general public in the South are living in the so-called security of our own insecurity. And that is a dangerous state of mind in my mind, in my opinion. And this is what I want to really uh, try and change by reviving at least hope. And in order to solve the Cyprus problem, of course, it's not enough just to revive hope. Uh, one needs to work hard to establish as much unity as possible on this one. And unity cannot be established by labelling people in a so-called pro or against solution, because I don't think that is the case. There may be some few people that made up their mind no matter what. But there is, uh, by and large, there is um, a good proportion of the society that do want a fair resolution of the Cyprus problem, fair solution, and they want to hear, and they want to hear an explanation of what we are really working on. And they also want to hear an explanation of what will, it will look like after a solution. We've never had this discussion, really. We've never really done a, a simulation, if you like, in the public of what the federal solution will look like. And I, I strongly believe uh, it is in the hands of the next government to do that as well. But talking about the, the Turkish Cypriots uh, that you asked me earlier, I think the Turkish Cypriot leadership needs to um, come out and clear its position if they really want to resume the talks from where we left, uh, because the UN Secretary General is very, very clear on that. He's not going to take any other initiative. The last one he took was back in May, uh, unless the two parties jointly uh, request from him to resume the talks, and of course we need to have a good preparation on that. So I'm quite clear on that. I will ask Mr. Akiji to really come on board. And, uh, and we need to work hard on the so-called internal issues to make a bit more progress and work in parallel for preparing the ground for the summit. It needs to be a well-prepared summit in coordination with, uh, with Greece, of course, uh, so because we cannot fail another time. Right, let's come on to the economy. The figures have been... Encouraging, I think it's fair yeah. to say, since the haircut and the whole recession and bailout and so on. There is feeling that with the backing of Akel, you would be obliged to use, if you like, their model for the economy, which I think we could all honestly admit was disastrous in the past. Yeah. So what's your answer to that? Because it's very important for our business communities and indeed for every person who's got to put their hand in their pocket just to buy the daily things yeah. that we don't go back down that hill. Okay, well, uh, one needs to see whether... Um, uh, things were so bad in the past because if you look at the figures despite the fact I do agree with you that the number of mistakes serious mistakes have been made by the previous government but if you look at the figures uh, the figures say that uh, in a number of sectors today we're worst off so we've gone further down and are now coming up again look at the banking sector for instance the banking sector had 72 billion euros and the banking sector today has 49 billion euros. It is the biggest reduction in bank deposits in the history of Cyprus. If you look at unemployment, uh, it's, it's one way. Uh, you need to look at the employment, not the unemployment. And you need to look at the actual figures, the actual numbers, not the percentages. Um, yes, uh, okay, but let's let talk me, let about the trade unions, for example. I'll, I'll talk and, about the and trade about unions. spending on public services and those sure, sort of I'll, things, I'll because I'll talk about those that. are the things that really, if we go back and it seems we're heading down the path to going back to the unions demanding cost of living allowance and all sorts of other things, that we know the state can't really afford. Sure, but you need to also have in mind that we need to have um, um, salaries that people can live in dignity, and that's not achieved, of course, through a trade union uh, agreement. Or, uh, nor will it be achieved through a complete uh, abolition 
of any agreement that is protecting workers, right? So you can't go to the two extreme, extremes. But let me go back and say a few figures because these are important. Um, the employment, the number of people in employment are actually less today than they were in 2012, where we had a really big crisis. I accept that. So what, what, uh, and the one-third of the population of Cyprus is below at the level of poverty. These are figures coming from the Eurostat. It's not my figures. These are not my figures. So what, what we've seen recently, after, of course, the bail-in, we've seen the economy coming up again, and it has reached the level today, as we speak, of 2009. This is the level of the economy today, the GDP of the country is in 2009. But if you look at the per capita income, that is 24% less. So you have an economy of the size of the 2009, but the size of the per capita income, that is the people's pocket, is 24% less. Yes, but so this is, is all part, is it not, of the recovery process. Well, and it is part it, of the with recovery. the right investment in particularly the private sector sure. and very much in research and development, I would Which suggest. Which I strongly agree. That those figures will rise. Yes, they will rise, but it very much depends on the direction the government, the new government, will take the country. And I think this government is, has really assigned a lot of attention to what I call the serendipity model of a Cypriot economy, selling a few passports, creating a casino, giving a few planning permissions, a little bit more hotels, to which, which are good. But, but have we invested in people uh, in research and development? Not a single penny extra in that. How on earth are you going to repatriate thousands of people staying outside Cyprus scientists, the brilliant minds? How are you going to reverse the brain drain that we all talk about? Cyprus has a massive advantage in that, and figures show that. It's a country that can do extremely well in that. So this is the kind of things that I want to do. I want to make an economy through a model of open innovation. Open innovation meaning that you are open-minded. You're, um, you're not bounded by any idiosyncrasies of thinkings of anyone's. Okay, an open-minded economy, but an economy that also protecting the, the worker but it's also protecting the good entrepreneur. Let me give you an example. A, young, a youngster now, if they go to find a job, they'll be offered five, six hundred euros, seven hundred euros maximum. Can they live on that? They can't live on that. Okay. People say, all right, but when the economy goes, it gets better, people will be able to get paid higher. But the economy today shows, particularly in the tourist sector, that they are able to pay more, but they're not pay paying people more. If you look at the... Um, and how could you as a I'll president I'll stop, I'll stop, your I'll government change that? I'll do that, right. So minimum wage. In the UK, you've got a minimum wage of £8 per hour, right? You've got a minimum wage. 22 countries have a minimum wage, right? Cyprus doesn't have a minimum wage. Well, only in the retail sector. No, no, no only, only, only in, in nine professions, which are uh, 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 what we call regulated by, by a ministerial decree, and it's, which is not binding anyway. And this is set to 870 euros, uh, and it goes up to uh, 9, 920 after six months, but it's not ob obligatory. And also, uh, when we opened this discussion a few months ago, the present Minister of Finance said, well, we need to reduce that by 20%. If you reduce that by 20%, that goes to the level of poverty. And the, and the President, I think it was a few days ago, said, we will only talk about a minimum wage when we have 100% employment, well, you can only get 100% employment if everybody gets paid, or most people get paid that are employed to their 500 euros. So when we actually force people to the lower wage limit, then we'll give them a, a statutory minimum wage, which means that we will force them to that. This is why it is important, when you have an economic crisis, to discriminate because between a viable economy and an economy that goes through an enlargement process. It's like the human body. You can go through an enlargement process, which is a proportionate, or you can go through an enlargement process, which is a disproportionate, or an outgrowth, like a cancer, that will kill you. So this is what I, I think is fundamentally important for people to realize. We want an economy that is open, that is innovative, an economy that gives opportunity to most people, not an economy that gives opportunity to a few entrepreneurs that are forcing down wages, that are taking 
the wealth of the country in one direction and depleting part of this wealth from, the, from, from mainly the workers and the middle class. That's how you restructure economy. Okay, but that didn't answer the question about trade unions. Well, and as soon unions- as we came out of the really serious part and we got out of the bailout, then the public sector unions started again to say, we want this, we want that, we want the other. Read my lips, as they say. Read my lips. No question of derailing stability of the economy. And the stability came after, after a lot of sacrifices from people. No compromises on that. Okay. You mentioned at a gathering recently that you would employ more than 50% Oh, a women. point, a point, yes. Yes. Do talk to us about your views on the gender discrepancy in Cyprus. It's bigger, I think, than in most other most countries. Most countries. I think, I think women need to get the, the, the place that they deserve in Cyprus. There are very, very uh, able women that, that can actually participate in government. And unfortunately, here in Cyprus, because of political nepotism, because of um, what I call... Uh, an ethos of the political elite, women have been left, mostly have been left out from government, they've been left out from semi-governmental organizations. They really need to gain uh, their position in this society that likes to call itself a European society, which is not, I'm afraid, in terms of, uh, of gender equality. This is why I think the president should be the first one to make a start, and I will appoint at least 50% of women in my cabinet, at least 50%, and I will also make sure that at least 50% of women will be appointed in the semi-governmental organizations, in the board of directors. And that will send a message that women can do their job, and in fact women can do a much better job than, than, than men. Um, just a couple of hours ago, I was visiting a, a very, very successful entity, I won't say which one was that, and uh, the vast majority of members of the board were women, and it's probably one of the most vibrant company we have in Cyprus, generating millions. And I want to do that for the whole of the country by giving women what they deserve. What is it, do you think, that women bring to the boardroom or to government jobs that is different from what men bring? Well, I think, I think women are more structured. Uh, women... Um, work um, uh, naturally they they are less prone and this is this is coming from scientific studies less prone to corruption i think that's important also and that's something we haven't talked about and yeah. that is the extent of corruption uh, it's a lot of corruption political how do you fight that well let's talk about the women make sure that uh, women bring uh, i'm sure they will be much more determined in fighting corruption that's really important and, and i think they're, they're much more effective, really, in, in high managerial positions because of that as well. Women see straight, sometimes men see sideways. And I think you understand what I mean. Now, in terms of corruption, okay, corruption is an extreme expression of political nepotism, right? Uh, and I think that uh, the Cypriot society has been plagued, really, by nepotism in general in, in all its structures. So you need to have, first of all, a president that is clean, and the president is not really coming from what we call the political establishment, and has shown that it can resist that. And I, when I was a minister of health, uh, if one thing I'm very proud of is that I did resist strongly and vehemently anything um, having to do with um, nepotism and uh, anything linking corruption with uh, the functioning of the, of the Ministry of Health. Now, the Attorney General and the Ombudsman's Office are the two uh, independent, if you like, bodies in our country. So I think we need to reinforce uh, the powers of um, uh, the Attorney General and the General Ombudsman. These are two independent uh, officers of the country that uh, not only should be looking after uh, the executive, that is, overlooking the executive, not looking after, <laughs> because some people want to want them to look after them rather than overseeing them. That's nepotism as well. But they should also be given the, the, the powers, really, and the means, because they're, they're, they're understaffed, to do the job well. 
and I think an independent attorney general's office, an independent general ombudsman office that is financially independent, not regulated by the Ministry of Finance, is one way forward. Of course, the other, the other way is, uh, is, is not a way. It's really um, through the behavior of the executive. If the executive knows the boundaries, the constitutional boundaries uh, of its functioning, then, of course, that is um, uh, how you promote democracy. If you think you can go over those boundaries and get into the boundaries of the independent regulators that are supposed there to check you, then you have a problem, and that's not me. Will you just round it up, please, by giving us your two or three major points that you want to get across before the vote in a couple of weeks? Well, I think that uh, the voters in this country will really need to look beyond what I call the, um, the political shopping, right? The, the political vitrines, right? And they need to see through people, they need to see through policies and discriminate between those telling them the truth and those actually patting them on the back. And if something, if there's one thing that most people actually acknowledge in me, uh, whether they agree with me or not, is that I'm telling people the truth. The truth how I will govern, and it will not be an Akel government, it will be a government made up of people that will come from all walks of life, provided they can do the job. It will be a government that will be looking after the majority of the society, in particular young people, and not a political elite and an economic establishment that has been running the country for so many years. And particularly with a government that will actually formulate policy based on scientific evidence, based on logic, and primarily based on transparency. That's my vision. And, of course, that vision to be translated into policies, we need to have in mind that it is the people that are voting for us and we're accountable to the people, not to the leaderships of any party. And that is Stavros Malas, one of our presidential candidates standing in the upcoming presidential elections. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.